These airbags have a lot of features. We throw me a T-handle, Timmy. These airbags are packed and stored in cases where this middle hub is not present, all right? When these inflate, they don't inflate like a pillow bag like you're used to with seams on the outsides. These inflate like a medicine ball, so they'll eventually end up looking almost spherical. Everybody follow that? Before you fill these, you have to cap these center points. You can either cap them with the existing caps or you could splice them together with one another. So if you want to connect this airbag to this airbag, you're gonna remove one of those collars, put in basically this piece of all thread with gaskets, and then you're enabled to take this airbag, put it on top of that airbag, spin it down, and they're both hard linked so you can't kick one out. Everybody follow that? Tremendous safety facet. When you do that, I always like to order, uh, orient my fittings so that they're both the same both of them on top, both of them on bottom. When you spin it down, those fittings should end up in line or on the same side of the bags with one another. If they don't, you have not fully seated the airbag. And if you haven't fully seated it, then you can have some, some failures of the system and the splicing element, okay? The only time it may not line up is if you're putting a smaller bag on top of a larger bag, and then the distance may be different. But it still shouldn't be too terrible. Yeah. But the key is to have the bags tight and the plates locked together. Another feature or option that you guys have is um, load plates. And you can put the base plates that are on the base of the struts that have the ability to interlock in with the cribbing. So if we weren't wanting to do some type of lift on like a cement mixer drum, something that's got a weird plane to it, and you didn't want these to kick out, you build a box crib that articulated with the composites, and you're trying to set these airbags on that plane, and you don't want them sliding down, you can put that base plate onto this airbag by setting it in place and then spinning down this keeper cap. Then you've got a base that you can put on there, interlock with the cribbing, and your airbags aren't gonna go anywhere. Or you can invert them, have a load plate on top. Whether this is on or not, one of the most unique things about these bags is as they lift, you do not decrease significantly in your lifting capacity because you've got all of this area of surface contact that's collecting the load. With a pillow bag, as it gets bigger and bigger, your surface contact does what? Smaller, smaller, which takes your lifting capacity and makes it plummet. These maintain a really large surface contact throughout the lift, so you've got a very consistent lifting capacity throughout. Timmy, on the small NT2 bags, what's your lifting capacity? This little bag, 8,800 pounds at full height. We used to have 16 airbags on our rescue. We replaced those 16 airbags with two of these big guys, the NT4s and two of the NT2s. They'll do more in height and in capacity than what our entire cache of 16 airbags would do. So remarkable airbags. All the accessories and features make sense to you guys? Okay, so we've got our pigtails at the airbags so that once we're inflated, if we want to DC those hoses and use them for another application, we can control that airflow and keep these in place, right? The other unique thing about these airbags is the amount of pressure that's inside of them and how they react to loads. Um, I'm going to let Tim talk to you guys a little bit about how they articulate and how they work with um, different planes, but if you were to DC this hose with this bag fully inflated, you're not going to get a violent reaction of air pressure. Everybody follow that? It's, it's, um, they're almost like a hybrid airbag of a combination between medium, low, and high pressures. Um, our lifting sequence on these is different as well. We want to take that top bag um, and instead of inflating uh, bottom and then top, there's an opposite order of how we inflate, how we capture, and at what level we're going to stop and then work on to the other bag. So Tim, go ahead and hit two facets for me. Hit our order of inflation and what we're looking for with each of those inflations, and then talk about how these will level themselves out or equalize even if the top bag's shifting and doing weird things. When you start with this system, you always start with the top bag. And the reason being is as you lift something, you're usually grounded at one point for a pivot point. Therefore, you're, you're load's going to follow an articulation, it's going to follow a plane, so it's going to roll away. The top bag inflated first is going to allow that bag to keep good contact and kind of turn with it, follow that rotation. And then you go to the next bag down, which would be your bottom one or the middle bag if you do three high. And then you inflate it because it has its base on the ground and that keeps the base on the ground flat. 
and then the top, being as it's round, it doesn't lift in the center like a pillow bag. So the weight can squash one side down a little bit and still allow it to follow the load and travel over without pushing all that force to shove the bags out from underneath the load. Now, the, if you look at the plates, the green circle, if you imagine those lined up in a column, you can go as far as you want as long as that ring at the top doesn't pass out of the side of that ring at the bottom. Does that make sense? The cone? As long as it's coming over, it doesn't pass outside of this ring, you're fine. And you'll notice at any at, at if you take that point too far, the bags are going to want to come out because you're kind of pushing instead of lifting at that point. Contacting what you're trying to lift, and because it lifts like a ball instead of a pillow from the center, man, you can get monstrous lifts just out of a... I mean, ideally you want the center mass point at your center lifting point, but you guys will see when we start working. You ready, Matty? Okay, when we integrate airbags and struts, you got two hoses that are going to go to each strut. On the couplings, you've got these dual stage couplings where you've got to depress the button um, when you're pulling them apart, pull it back a little bit, let go of the button, don't pull tension on it, hit the button again, and then pull it out. So it's a two-step coupling in, in theory, which is a great safety feature because you can't accidentally jerk one off. You gotta be very intentional about removing the couplings, okay? Can you say that again? I yep, and, and I'll show you. If I were to plug this in, it's just a push. Locks in place, even though you hear two clicks. When I wanna take this out, I gotta push this black button, and it's gonna come back one stage. Did everybody see that? I can't be pulling on it when I go to hit it again. I'm just gonna relax, hit it again, and it pops right out. Now it's still functioning. You connected all this in, and you go to run things, and you're not getting pneumatics where you wanna get pneumatics, you probably have not fully seated one of the couplings. That's one of the first troubleshooting applications. The silver controller is your strut controller. The gold controller is your airbag, okay? On the strut itself, you've got two male fittings on it. You're gonna see one has an arrow, One's got a C, one is an inlet, one is a recirc valve. So you've got a continuous flow of air that's going through these struts. You have to make sure that how you connect the hoses to the struts correlate to the symbols on the controller. So if I put the blue line to the arrow on the strut, the blue line's gotta go to the arrows on the controller. Everybody with that? Mm -hmm. On the underside, you got the C's. If you connected yellows to C's, then yellows goes to C's here. Now, Tim, have you found any issues with how these get organized as far as if they're crossed over or diagonalized? It doesn't make any difference as long as you're with arrows and C's correlating to the strut. Everybody good? Okay. We said we're going to set our, our regulator at 145 PSI to run our airbag, right? For these struts, we don't want to pneumatically lift the load. Remember, we talked about that with pneumatics. You never want to lift the load pneumatically. What we want to do is we want to chase the load. These struts lock every 1 25th of an inch, so we just need enough residual air in the struts that they're going to want to keep progressing, but not so much air that they're actually lifting. Everybody follow that? So what we found is about two bar um, that we want to keep as a reserve in the strut. So Tim, go ahead and walk them through the sequence about... ...is the green button charges the system and basically loads the strut. Depending on if you were using, majority of the time, if you're using the medium strut or lower, two bars is plenty of air. You know, you're talking about 30 PSI air in that area. And that's enough pressure to extend the strut and follow your load automatically because the mechanical mechanism is what locks it, not the air. The air is just going to shove it up for you like you were standing there. And you won't have to be anywhere near it. Now, the, the other thing that can happen is when we're done, we can actually use the red button and we'll hold down on it. And then once we raise the load a little bit and unlock that strut, it basically, the red button holds those locks open the entire time. So you hold the red button down, the locks stay open, and then as you let the airbags down, the struts will actually collapse themselves and come down from the pressure of the load. That's why we don't want to put too much air in them, because it may start lifting the car. It's a 15-ton strut, so we have to have enough pressure to, you know, hold up and, and extend on a long distance. But at the same time, they'll work on the lightweight bit as well. So what we'll do is with the bar on the inside, we'll just push a little air to it, get up to about two bars, and we're good to go. We don't have to mess with this anymore. Now, the button on the back side that you saw earlier, the C button, that's that little black button right here, 
that kind of clears the system. So when we're down and we want to take the struts out, somehow we'll get that air pressure out of there so they just don't keep extending on us. And you just hold that down until the system's clear and there's no air pressure, and then the struts will just come out. Mm -hmm. um, so like when you're depressurizing and going down, you don't have to do anything with the struts? You when, have to hit the black. when I'm depressurizing, if you're coming down, you always have to hold the red button. But you want to depressurize those prior to doing the, do you want to keep the weight on the bag and not the strut? Okay, the, it is a specific sequence. So when we get ready to come down, you're going to have to hit and hold the red button to, to release the pressure and the locks that are on the struts. The struts are locked every, because they're at that 1 25th of an inch travel with resistance. So to take that load off, you got to go up on your airbags. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. To get the load off of the strut. Right. So it's just a touch on green. As soon as you see the load start to shift, you're going to rock right down to dump on your airbags, yep. and then the whole system's going to come down together. And you're holding the red button the entire time on the strut. You are, OK. You yes. Because it basically, that lock works like this. As you raise, it opens up and goes up, and then the pressure against it locks it. So when you hold the air, what we're doing is basically putting the air underneath it with the red button and holding it open the entire time. But you have to raise it just a hair to unlock it. Okay. Because it can't fail. It's not built so that it can ever drop. Okay. You can't drop it with the load on it. So if you take a strut and hold your pressure against it, hit that green button, it won't come down. Okay. Okay. I may not still have two bar of air on there. If I don't have two bar of air on there, I'll usually goose it a little bit and get back up to that two bar of air. Does that make sense? So I'm watching the load. I want to make sure I'm not moving. Sarah, watch that load for me. Okay, once I'm at two bar, now I know I've got enough in there to disengage the lock mechanism and come back down, okay? So I'm going to hit and hold on red on the struts. I'm going to go up on my airbag and immediately rock down to the bleed on the airbag. So I'm going to take the pressure off the strut and then everything's going to walk down together. The greatest thing about it is if the load starts to get unstable or something bad happens, I let go of everything. It blows off the excess, the struts lock. Hold the load right where it's at. 